The Bay of Peninsula is on the southwest coast of Ireland between Kenmare Bay and Bantry Bay, making it the only peninsula in Ireland that lies between two counties. These counties are Cork and Kerry. It's so diverse from prehistoric times right up to recent history. Alhees featured in the Daphne de Muir novel, Hungry Hill, later made into a film. Other movies filmed in the area include Falling for a Dancer, Undine, Byzantium, Tama Tama and The Purple Taxi. The population of the peninsula peaked at 39,000 before the Great Famine, but today there are less than 6,000 living in the area. I came here as a Gerda from uh, Cork City in 1992. Um, I settled here, I loved everything about it, you know, the people, the scenery, <coughs> the history. Um, I met my wife here, she's a native of here, and, and um, this is where I'm stuck now for better or worse. So. <laughs> when you come to a place like this, you know, it, um, history's all around you. You, you come down and you, you find all the stone circles and all the archaeological sites here. I mean, there's, there's over 500 archaeological sites in the Bayer Peninsula. Dunboy too, of course, is a big story. That was a kind of turning point in Irish history, you know, because it was there the last of the Gaelic chieftains fell, Don Law Sullivan Bear. Um, after the Battle of Kinsale, about six months after that, the big famous siege that was there. And when O'Sullivan Bear left Bear and left Ireland, that was the end of, of the Gaelic way of life and the old Gaelic princes. He went to exile in Spain. He was hoping to get assistance from King Philip in Spain, but um, that never materialised because they were trying to keep the peace. It's Again, it's European and international history. That happened right here in Bear, just out the road from Castledon Bear. The Sullivans came here in the 12th century. They weren't the original. You know, the, the Donegans and the McCarthy's were here before them. They mightn't like me saying that now, but... <laughs> um, so that castle was probably built ar around the, the 14th century, the, the old O'Sullivan Bear Castle. Um, mm. And uh, it fell then in, in 1602. But there is evidence as well of, you know, I, there is a kind of zigzag uh, wall around it. So that would have been more from Cromwellian times after by so obviously the British built some kind of a fort there after even after 1602. Mm -hmm. Then you have the Ali's copper mine story. The, there, were, there was co copper discovered there in 1812. Was, uh, a Colonel Hall was on in his boat and he dis he, he, he he looked back into uh, Dunneen there, just where the cliffs are there as you're going before Reintris between Ali's interest and he noticed the blue on the rock. And he was uh, he had studied geology and he. Uh, knew that there was copper then, there was copper there, and they discovered that there was copper in them there hills. Um, Puxley, who was the landlord, moved fast, so he decided he's going to take those. He, he bought up the lands that were there, and he made his fortune then to Bearhaven copper mines. And that started the story of copper mining in Elihis, and it went on for 70 odd years through the 19th century from 1812 until. 1883 or 1884 and then it wound down and the, the mass of the population of the people of Alihis immigrated to mostly to Butte in Montana but in between those 70 odd years there's a there's a fantastic story of mining but not only mining but people and Alihis became the centre of uh, the mining industry in Ireland one of the richest in Europe and um, it was also, interestingly, the reason why Castletown Bear uh, became a town, because uh, commerce and money and uh, the economics of the Bear Peninsula changed, and Castletown Bear became the, as it were, the administrative cap capital. At its peak during the 1840s, it employed 1,500 people, and we estimate the population of Alihis at that time was in the region of 4,000, uh, if you have the extended families of the miners, etc., etc. Um, this is, uh, the, the, compared to today, the population of Alihis is in the region of 500 people. Pre-1812, it was also in the region of uh, five, 600 people. So the population exploded during those years when the mines were working. John Puxley, his family originally came to Ireland uh, during the Cromwellian Wars which was much earlier, and they settled in Galway. 
and they were very friendly with the heirs uh, who also came to Ireland uh, during the Cromwellian period. Uh, and you would have heard of uh, Air Square in Galway. It, they're named, that's named after the heirs who came with Cromwell's army. They were granted lands in different parts of Ireland uh, after their services uh, during those period of, 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 of in the British army. And uh, Air was granted the lands of Beira and he was living in Galway so he wasn't that interested in coming down to Beira and collecting rents and organising different, different uh, grants and permissions of land which he now owned so he sublet it as it were to the Puxleys and the Puxleys arrived uh, during the 1700s uh, in Tibera and they were the people who actually managed the affairs for Ayr on the ground, Robert Ayr. When he came first, uh, the clan, the local clan were the O'Sullivans. Puxley was very friendly with the O'Sullivans and they got involved in lots of things like smuggling, which was uh, very much part and parcel of how people in Beira lived and uh, the commerce of Beira. And I mean smuggling to places like Spain and France uh, by sea, which you would have brandy and uh, other exotic things like that coming in, and wool and uh, you know leathers maybe going out. But he got involved with the O'Sullivans and they had a very fine trade for a while and then they, as, as happens they fell out and they became enemies. Um, and this was all pre the mining times in Alihis uh, and it culminated with Murty Oak shooting uh, one of the Puxleys in at Dunboy on his way to Mass on a Sunday morning. And of course Murty Oak O'Sullivan was later killed himself out near Iris and the house is still there, you could see it. Built into the whole picture as well when John Puxley was in his prime in Beira we're coming into the early 19th century here now, late 1700s. The population of the country exploded and the, 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 it exploded for a reason because the humble spud uh, had been brought into Ireland much earlier, uh, several hundred years before. And the population of Ireland increased from uh, around 4 million to over 8 million in a very, very short space of time, right coinciding with the mining in Elihis. It, the, it, it increased over over doubled in that period of time, over roughly 50 years, uh, from the late 1700s until 1845. Um, so when John Puxley started his mine in Elihis in 1812, there was no shortage of labour, there was no shortage of manpower or woman power, and he had a huge uh, workforce to pick from. The, there were small famines in Ireland through the 1830s, 1840s, but the major one was in 1847, which, uh, when the potato crop failed generally in the country. And then you had starvation, and then things changed in a very, very big way, and the population of Ireland decreased in a very short space of time. John Puxley, to come back to him, he actually brought in grain and potatoes to feed the workforce in Elihis. Why did he do it? We'd like to think it was he was concerned about the people, but it also coincided with peak production in the mine and he was producing a lot of copper which was going to Swansea for smelting, he was making a lot of money and he wanted to keep production going. Uh, so maybe that's why he had ulterior motives. He brought it in down to Ballydunagan here by ship, sometimes across the mountain from Castletown Bear, the old road across the mountain by horse and cart, but he kept it. it so long story very short, the, the famine did not affect the Alihis area too much because of that. There was lots of debt, there was starvation, but it was more to do with strikes at the mine and uh, shutdowns and so on when people weren't being paid so they starved because they had no money to, 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 to buy food. But the actual um, famine itself did not impact too much. John Puxley, at the beginning of the story, right through 1812 up to 1820, the mid-1820s, he nearly micromanaged the mine. You know, he was, he was every detail he was on it. He wanted to know how much was being produced. He found out very early on that there was, uh, he had a major problem because when he started off, he had uh, Irish people working here who, who knew very, very little about mining. And uh, after two or three years, he discovered that this wasn't producing what, the, what, he, what he had hoped. He brought in a mine captain from Cornwall because Cornwall, as you would probably know, is uh, or has been or was, uh, centre of mining for many, many years previous to that, uh, copper and tin mainly. But John Puxley knew that they had the expertise, so he brought in a mine captain from Cornwall, and that started the whole Cornish connection to Elihis. Um, the first uh, gentleman was a guy called Edward Nettles, and he was here for two or three years. But John Puxley was checking the books, and he was checking the output, and he was checking everything, and as I said, he nearly micromanaged it. 
and he knew that uh, Mr Nettles wasn't doing the business. He was employing too many people for what was being produced. It wasn't viable and he fired him off back to Cornwall and he brought in uh, more mine captains and he, then he brought in Cornish engineers and miners. The mine captains were the people on the ground who ran the show for John Puxley in the, on the, in the mines in Alleghies and they ran a super show. They organised everything, they knew how to deal with people, they knew how to do what they call bargains with the miners. They uh, set the deals in advance how much you would be paid if you produce a certain amount of copper. This was for the people who worked underground. Uh, he organised the workforce on the surface. Uh, the mine captain was the man on the ground who knew everything. And John Puxley, once he got those people in, the really uh, top class uh, Cornish mine captains, he was on a winner. And it produced, start, the mine started to take off. The money started to take off. The uh, workforce in the mine increased from, you know, it started off at 100. You could see the graph, 200, 500. Up to the 1840s, 1,500 people, 1,600 people actually working in the mines. The average life spent for a man would be about 40, 41 or 42. They got miners long. The men worked below in the mines. The women and children uh, broke up the, the rock and separated the rock from the copper above. Um, horrific conditions. We have no idea the type of conditions they had. And uh, very low wages. They went on strike a few times and they were just ignored. They had no wages and they were just starving, so they had to go back to work. Um, men that went down, down into the mines didn't see daylight for six months because they went down at 6 a.m. in the morning, came up at 6 p.m. So it was dark when they went down, it was dark when they came up for a whole six months, for the, the winter months. So you had have people with horse and carts bringing the, the ore from the mine down to the beach, because the beach down here, you, you, you can see the beach in Elihis, it's not a beach, it's an artificial beach. It wasn't there in 1810, it wasn't there in 1811. It started to, be, to, to take shape, we presume, in 1812, because what it is, is the waste of the mine. It's the waste from what was produced out of the mountain up behind us. It's crushed quartz. Uh, the, the copper ore in Elihis was t extracted from quartz. Another factor which made it very viable in a very, very uh, far-flung outpost of Western Europe is that the copper content that they extracted from this quartz was very, very high. As time went on, you go through the 1820s, 1830s, the micromanaging decreased. He, went, he, 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 he wasn't as involved. His wife was ill. He didn't actually spend an awful lot of time in Dunboy, which he had hoped to do, because if you look at the, the building, the mansion in Dunboy, if you drive down in front of it, it's, different, it's built in three different stages. The original was on the right-hand side. Like, like, it was more like a, a tower house, and uh, Puxley called that Dunboy Castle after the older one. Then the, the middle section was built later on, and finally, in the late 1800s, the, the main part was built by John Puxley and uh, that house was never really lived in because his wife died in childbirth. She's buried out in Ardugal. Um He went to England to work. The mine closed. It peaked, production peaked 1840s. But as it, the, the, that was the peak, it coincided with peak production now. He's, it started to wind down from there on. During the 1860s especially, people started to go. There was tickets available to be bought in Elihis. The tickets were, you could buy, uh, if you could afford it, was for the United States. You could start in Elihis, you could go to Castletown Bear across the mountain on the road, probably by horse or maybe more than likely by walking. And from, Eli from Castletown Bear you went to Bantry by boat. That was the route. The roads were tracks that you could barely walk on. Um, by boat to Bantry, by rail to Cove, and then uh, you would go on the coffin ships. They were dark, dank, wet, damp, crammed. And they would have been in these ships crammed together uh, for seven weeks. Uh, a lot of them didn't make the crossing. They didn't survive it. They were not only were they seasick, but there was disease was rampant. There was no hygiene. It was non-existent. So they were, when you died, you were just thrown over the side. Those who made it, just remember, these people now only spoke Irish. They had never been on a boat before in their lives because fishing was not that big around Beira at the time. So they would have arrived in Boston, New York, and uh, the other, the, the, the Canadian ports. Uh, and their, their goal was to get to Butte, Montana. They were now miners. You had probably three generations of people from Alleghies who were just miners. They didn't know anything about farming. They didn't want to know anything about farming. They were used to being paid. So this was the goal, to get to Butte, Montana, which in many ways 
was replicated Elihis. It was a mad place. Like mining towns, Elihis today is quite and it's scenic and it's beautiful and all that. But when I tell the story, it was rough and it was ready and there was crime and there was drinking and there was lots of things going on. But they arrived in Butte, Montana and they made a living there. Wages were better in Butte, so a lot of them got out in time. Um, I mean, Butte is another story. Men were sharing beds. The, 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 the men doing the, the day shift, the, 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 the um, mines in, in, in Butte were operated 24 hours a day. So the men doing day shifts would sleep during the night. Then the guy, he'd go take up duty on the mines and the, the other fellow come in from mines would go into his bed. They were, they were like ants, really. And they made their living there and they turned it into a mad Irish town. So an awful lot of families from this area st still would have relatives in, in uh, Butte, Montana one of the most remotest cities in, in the United States, and it's all Sullivans and Harringtons and O'Shea's and Murphy's and even still. There's a great international dimension to this whole Elihis mining story because at the beginning of it, as I was saying, the Cornish came in with their expertise to get the mines going. There was never more than 20, 25 Cornish here at any one time. We're, we're, we're sitting here now in the museum, which was originally built in 1845 as a Methodist chapel for the Cornish. It all wound down in the 1860s, 70s and finished in the 1880s. They were closed for many years. Um, copper was, and it's a very finite resource. And there's only so much of it in the world. So uh, it is used, like, the, the, during the 19, the early part of the 20th century, uh, the demand for copper was around armaments. It was around shell casings and things like that. So the First World War caused a spike in the price of copper. And there was a move to open the mines in Elihis, and it did open in 1929-30, but only very briefly. So they pumped out some of the water, they did some exploration, they did some drilling, but it got nowhere. But a much more serious attempt was made in the late 50s. Um, there was a serious attempt by a Canadian company based in Toronto, and they pumped it all out, and they then went down at the bottom, which is 1,500 feet down, which is two-thirds of the level is, uh, of this mine is under sea level, and they drilled another 1,500 feet, and they uh, took samples to see what kind of copper content was left d at a deeper level. And the results, we have never been told exactly what the results were, but anyways, it closed down in 1962. The physical structure uh, of the mines is still there, um, up here in the, in the mountain, in mountain mine as we call it. We have floodlit the engine house, which was built to house the big steam engines that were brought in to get the, 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 the mines working uh, to their maximum capacity. But up there, it's floodlit at night, it's a fantastic sight to see, and uh, what we have around us here now at this minute where we're doing this filming is the Copper Mine Museum. Uh, since then, uh, what we now have is a plan to reopen the mine as a tourist attraction, which is a long-term, environmentally friendly, sustainable project. But if we can get that project off the ground, then we would really be able to bring the complete story. You can touch and feel and see what it was like to be living and working in Elihis during that period. We will keep at it until we try to get that project off the ground as well, which would be fantastic for not only Elihis, but for the Beira Peninsula. The original church was built in the, in the mid-1800s, and it was found because there was a massive, there was a lot more people living here then than there is now. I mean, before the famine, there was 25,000 people living in the Bayer Peninsula. Today, there's about 5,000, so that's a massive drop. But the present-day church, the, the granite that, that built that church was brought by boat down from the Morden Mountains, which was the best granite in the country. Um, how did the people afford to, to build a church like that? The local people didn't. It was money, basically, from the Irish Americans, um, probably a lot of it in Butte, uh, fundraising, plus a lot of the, the British Navy personnel here too, um, based in Bearhaven, paid for it. So that's, that's where the, the funding came from. I mean, it, it must have been uh, a huge undertaking at the time, at a huge cost as well. There was a Canon MacDonald here from Kerry at the time, and it was he instigated it. So it was uh, opened in, in uh, 1911, uh, the Bishop of Kerry came down and uh, that would be open mass and we, we got the newspaper cuttings because we celebrated it in, in um, 2011, the centenary of it. The Sisters of Mercy came here in the mid-1860s, I think the 1864, 
um, there was a lot of poverty in like most of Ireland, but especially the west of Ireland that time. Um, and uh, the nuns set up a convent here. The first, there were, you know, where the present Garda station is. Uh, at the back of that, there was a Mrs. Gearn donated a, a house to them there. And that's where they operated for nearly 10 years. But any time there was high tide and a lot of rain, something like today, the, the building was getting flooded. In fact, that garden at the back still gets flooded with high tides and, and heavy rain. So they moved in and uh, they built a little place, the old convent up at the back of the town there in the mid 1860s. And uh, the nuns really did they, they did great work. They did the work that, like a lot of the, the religious orders, I know they've got bad press in the last number of years, but, you know, they they set them an, an orphanage there as well as schools, and then they they were teaching the children, especially girls, lace-making, which was very... It sounds kind of petty now, but, I mean, it, it gave a lot of women employment. Child labour was... I, it wasn't just here in Ireland, like it was everywhere that time, child, you know, children were put to work because it was survival, really. They had to, they, they, the ones looking to get an education early, not, and not all have got, got an education, but your education stopped after national school, really, and you were put working no matter what it was. Orphanages, there was a lot of orphans that time, you know, because there would have been people drowned at sea, there would have been people, you, you know, uh, children basically neglected and everything like that so they had an orphanage there and the main thing oh the hospital as well of course they set up the hospital mm -hmm. so uh, between health and education you know things that governments are supposed to do but uh, they took up the flat there so i think we you know how many generations later we can be very grateful to them you know the British presence in Bear Island until 1938 and the famous handover there just a couple of weeks before World War Two broke out. I mean that's 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 nearly international history, like on our, our doorstep here. You know the way Wolf Tone came into um, with the French ex expedition in 1798. Well, it goes back again to European history. The 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 conflicts are the between between Britain and France and and Spain, their traditional enemies. So they, it was all about security. Uh, they felt that if there was going to be an invasion and the threat of an invasion was very serious, it would probably come through the southwest, the nearest point to, to, to Europe. So they uh, decided to establish a big uh, military base in Bear Island, or Bear Haven as they called it, after the Napoleonic Wars, which finished in 1814. Um, it was a fa fairly important base from British naval uh, terms. At at one stage, they had the most powerful gun in the world there, you know, where the, the readout is at the moment. Uh, apparently, it was the, the most fa most powerful gun in the world. The, the, the American Navy came in there too during World War I, uh, towards the, the end of 1917. So uh, there, there was a famous uh, um, photograph taken of, of three of the biggest uh, American um, warships there, uh, the Utah, the Oklahoma and the Nevada based there on their way to war and uh, they, 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 I think the three of them were torpedoed in Pearl Harbor afterwards in World War Two, those three. And um, <coughs> a lot of the men that passed through Bear Island, of course, Bear Haven that time, died in the trenches in, in, uh, in France during, you know, the, the terrible war, what's called the, the Great War. Uh, nothing great about war, is there? But, um, and then during our War of Independence, there was an internment camp set up there as well, uh, where a lot of the um, people were, uh, you know, anybody that people felt had Sinn Féin sympathies were interned there. And uh, um, a few famous people like uh, Professor Al Al Alfred O'Rahilly, who was president of UCC afterwards, he was there interned. Um, so yeah, a lot of history in Bear Island. Yeah. Not history. Some some nice archaeological sites there too. It was a very nice wedge grave, and what is very in, ba in Bear Island too. Of course, you have Lonehart, which is a Viking harbour. It was built by the Vikings, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a Viking fee. You can see the the remains of Viking farm settlement there as well. So it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. The Sullivan brothers. I I'm not sure how far back the but their their um great grandfather the great great grandfather came from Ardugal that's established them but they were yeah there were there were five five brothers and they were in the same boat in during world war uh, 2 
the American Navy. Uh, the boat was torpedoed out and the five brothers were lost. So um, it was a remarkable story and a lot of remarkable stories during, during the war years, but that was very, so remarkable that the American Navy bought in this, um, it's called the Sullivan Law, uh, that brothers couldn't serve in the same boat. Um, and that's still there at the moment. And as well as that, then the the sister, sister and mother were invited to the White House to President Roosevelt. Uh, they were on national radio and everything like that, you know, you know, that, that they were that Mrs. Sullivan had given her five sons to the war effort and everything like that. It was all I suppose I suppose we'd call it propaganda now, but sure. Yeah. Um, kind of motivating the troops and all that. And they um commissioned a, a, a boat as well, a warship called the USS Sullivan's. Um, that was decommissioned, uh, I think, in the, the early 90s, um, maybe about 20, 25 years ago, and there was a new US Sullivan's, USS Sullivan boat uh, commissioned. The local chief of the um, O'Sullivan clan here, Jim O'Sullivan from Drown, uh, was invited out to the, the commissioning um, ceremony for that. So he invited them as as a chief of the Sullivan clan. He invited them to Beira. So that boat was brought in here in a big ceremony for over a weekend in uh, 2013. That's when those plaques were unveiled. There are two, there are two plaques there actually, yeah. there are the two piers. Um, the remains of the, the old homestead are still there, but it's, it's, it's only rubble at the moment. I think a lot of the stone from the original house was put into the building of the, the Wild Atlantic Bear. At the moment, I'm researching, you know, this decade of centenaries that we're, we're commemorating at the moment. I'm researching all the casualties that happened in Beira from 1916 to 1923. That's right up to the end of the Civil War. They would be, they'd range from, you know, civilians, including two women, uh, British soldiers, Coast Guard officers, few policemen, as well as IRA volunteers. So um, it, it's a lot, you know, from a small close-knit area, from an area that was quite enough during those times. But um, And there's possibly more as well. Puxley Castle, of course, is a different story. There was a caretaker and his wife there, a man called Albert Thomas. And um, uh, in 1921, the IRA, during the War of Independence, they burned down the local IRA here uh, because they heard that the, the British military were going to use it as a base, they were going to move out from Bear Island. So that was born in, in 1921. Well, my name's Adrian McCarthy, and I'm from McCarthy's Bar in Castletown Bear. And it's quite a historical business, really, because it was started in 1860 by my great-grandfather. It then passed down to the hands of my grandfather, who was Dennis Florence McCarthy. Dennis had 10 children and my dad was one of those 10 children. Uh, so my dad grew up here in Castletown Bear and uh, went to primary school here, but then for secondary education he went to Clongo's near Dublin. Then he came back to UCC and became a doctor. And then um, because he couldn't get a job in Ireland he went off to England and joined the Air Force. Um, he was only in his early 20s but they soon went up the ranks because they had to in those days and he was a medical officer and at the start of his um, career really he was in Dunkirk which is uh, as you know the start of the war they were trying to evacuate the troops from mainland Europe back to England and he was on the beaches there for three days and three nights and it was a terrifying time because they were being attacked and shot at so um, it, that would be most people's war story altogether, but actually after that uh, he had even more times because he was um, senior medical officer in RAF Huntington and a plane came in and the undercarriage didn't go down properly so it actually crashed onto a bomb dump and everybody else was running off in the opposite direction but because my dad was a doctor he had to run to help and he actually pulled three men from a burning plane which was on a bomb dump which was pretty scary but he received one of the highest awards you can get uh, in the forces which was the George Medal so he had to go to Buckingham Palace to receive that and he was only 28 at the time so after that then uh, he was sent to help with the uh, Singapore they thought was going to fall in during the World War Second World War 
and uh, they went out on a troop ship to help but by the time they got out there Singapore had fallen so they actually went into Java so they were just sorting themselves out in Java when the Japanese came in and he was captured and taken prisoner of war so he spent three and a half years in captivity two years of which were in camps in Java yeah, they were brutally treated and uh, not a nice time but he was a doctor through it all and he tried to help other people and he did what he could and even to help someone die with a bit more dignity really this was his feeding bowl really from when he was a prisoner so it's just a water bottle that was cut in half and as you can see they, he has his name on it he had time enough to do that but he would have got his maggoty rice in this that was all they got just their rations so even with the rice they would just uh, take the maggots out from the rice and they would give those to the very sick people. It would be a bit of extra protein for them. So my dad was 14 and a half stone going to war. And when he came home, he was seven stone. So you can imagine the nourishment. Uh, so after two years, they were running short of manpower up in mainland Japan because all the men had gone off to fight. So they brought prisoners of war up by a convoy of ships up to the Japanese mainland. So even on the way up towards the Japanese mainland, uh, he had a lucky escape because he was in a steel-hulled ship. It was carrying over a thousand prisoners. The ship had used to carry grain and rice, so there were a lot of rats on it. So during the night, uh, the rats would come out and eat their feet, so he had a netting over his feet. And uh, a rat got tangled up in the net, so he sat up to disentangle it, and as he did, there was an American submarine that thought it was a Japanese ship bringing food to Japanese mainland, so they torpedoed it. So as the torpedo struck with a steel-hulled ship, it reverberated, and everyone that was lying down got their neck broken. But my dad was sitting up battling with the rats, so he actually survived that. So from over a 1,000 prisoners, less than 100 survived. So he was in the water for 12 hours, having swum away from it. He was a great swimmer, having grown up in Vera. But uh, he, he was in the water for 12 hours and then they got picked up by a Japanese troop ship and when they realised who they were they got beaten up and thrown back into the water. So then he was in the water another 12 hours and he got picked up by Japanese whaling ships that were returning after six months at sea. So they were taken into the port of Nagasaki. And when they got into Nagasaki the people there didn't want them and they told the people on the boat to just take them out to sea and dump them. They said, no, we're just back after six months fishing trip, so they're staying here now and that's it. So they were taken and just used as slave labour in the steel factories and the coal mines. But again, my dad was trying to help as best he could with people, uh, just whatever he could do. So uh, they, they carried on and then uh, the war was coming to an end and the bombings were intensifying, so luckily they were allowed to build a shelter so one day they were told to go out and dig a hole which was 20 foot by 20 foot and when he was digging it they suddenly realised that it was a mass grave that they were going to be just machine gunned into a horrifying thought really so then the sirens went off and they were allowed to go into their shelter and that was when the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki so when they felt a rush of warmer and when they came out they just thought that it was the end of the world because where there had been Nagasaki and the camp that was just gone and black rain started and there was just general panic and chaos but again he tried to keep a bit of law and order and see what was going on and he actually ended up working in caves with the Japanese trying to help whoever he could so then they got rounded up again and put in a schoolhouse outside Nagasaki and three days later the surrender came so my dad was a senior officer and uh, he received the surrender and uh, as a token of respect from the commanding officer he received a samurai sword. So this is the sword that was presented to my dad at the surrender in Nagasaki and it was given by the commander of the camp who was called Kasuno. So he also gave him a photograph of himself with the sword and on the back in Japanese is written uh, wishing you well in peacetime. So obviously he appreciated that uh, Dad had been a doctor through all his captivity and he had been trying to help others. And even, as I said, after the bomb was dropped, he actually worked with the Japanese 
in caves trying to help Japanese and prisoners alike. And I think that that was respected. So uh, later on, they were transported back uh, when the Americans came in to help them. And they went across the Pacific from Japan to San Francisco. And from San Francisco, they went across Amer America by train to New York. And then from New York, they actually came on a ship all the way to Southampton in England. And then my dad made his way back up and he arrived in the docks in Dunleary in November of that year. And uh, with his family from Castleton Bear, they went up to meet him. And he had the kick bag, kick kit bag over the arm and the sword in the other hand. And it's always been a sort of a sign of his surviving the war and uh, still a doctor through it all. So he stayed on in the Air Force and had quite a career. So he met my mum, who was from Galway, and they lived in Hong Kong. And then two of us arrived, my sister and myself, and we lived in France for four years, and we lived in Germany for four years, and we lived all over England, but always Castleton Bear was important to us and home. Any house that we were in, we would always have the sword hanging up, and we would say to our dad, you know, tell us about our dad and tell us what you did. But he would say, oh, another time, or maybe when you're a bit older, and I think it was so horrific and what they had been through that he really didn't want to terrorise us with what it was. So it was really in the 70s that um, he got a brain tumour and again they think that that was from all the beatings he got when he was a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. And after the brain tumour, which was luckily benign, the doctors told him to delve into his memory and use his mind, which he did, and he just wrote his story out, just in, wrote it by hand. Um, and that was when we really realised what he had been through and what, what, what he had done. But he really lived life and loved life, and I think he was so pleased to have survived. And um, we were very lucky to have him. Even though he should have retired, he kind of worked on for them until he was 80. And he did medical boards, uh, first of all for pilots, and then for people that wanted to join the Air Force. So my own story is that uh, I was a nurse in London, and my last uncle that was here died... So my dad said that we'd have to sell the business and because it had been something special in our lives. I said, well, just keep the business going until I qualify and just go back and try it out for six months. So I came back for six months and now I've been here for 40 years. So I've really enjoyed having been here and meeting different people, seeing uh, how times have changed. I mean, when I came back, there was no such thing as mobile phones and maybe the art of conversation was a bit better in the bar but it's a great community and there's um, a lot going on and it's interesting because you get not just the fishermen but you get the tourists and a lot of people wanting to visit Barra and they have to want to come here because it is a little bit apart but that's maybe the beauty of it as well. Those are his um, medals that we just got put into a little case but the first one is the OBE uh, which is a good one, but the most important one is the George Medal, the second one along, and that's the one he got for rescuing the men from the burning plane. And then two years ago, uh, they opened a hospital in RAF Honington. It was opened by Prince Harry, so we got to meet him, which was very nice. But they hold him in such high esteem on that station. It's amazing. He's a real hero, which was surprising for us to see because to us, he was still just our dad, and I know every dad is a hero, but... Um, you know, he really is very highly thought of. So then these are Pacific Service Stars, and then this is the War Medal. And then this last one is actually a Papal Award. It's a Knight of St. Sylvester. And uh, I think he was just, it just realised that he was, had great humility and his humanity, really, it was recognised. Yeah, we just heard, we we're very excited that there's a, an air ambulance base has just opened in Mill Street, which is so important for the area, especially Bearer and that the base is actually going to be named after him. So he would have been thrilled to have got Irish recognition. So yeah, Pete McCarthy, he was a writer, and he wrote the book McCarthy's Bar, and that was published probably in 1999. So when he was doing research for his book, he just happened to be passing through Castletown Bear, and as he was called Pete McCarthy, he was told, never pass the bar with your name on it. So he came in, and it just happened to be the night of my birthday, so of course, there was a bit of a party going on, which he joined in with, and we had a good, a good celebration. So um, we just thought he was passing through. 
But uh, a few weeks later, he rang up and he said, uh, oh, I've written a book and I'm going to call it McCarthy's Bar because that's my name. And it's about the popularity of Irish bars. So he said, well, I'd like to put your bar on the cover. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted. So they came over and they took the picture. And just as they were taking the picture, my pug dog went out the doorway and he got caught in the photographs. So then about two weeks later, this uh, book arrived on the counter and um, I opened it and I was so thrilled to see Bailey in the front door going out and Pete was there. It's called McCarthy's Bar and then I just opened it and chapter six was All Night Hooley in McCarthy's Bar so I nearly dropped because I didn't expect to be in it first of all and then it was a bit of a shock and then I thought what would the local sergeant think man that we didn't finish till four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> So uh, that was a bit of a shock. But uh, anyway, I said, oh, well, it won't sell many anyway. And of course, it was number one bestseller for about two years. And it hasn't done us any harm, really. And um, the local sergeant at the time was Fafna O'Donovan. So he gave me a ring one day to say, uh, oh, yeah, congratulations on the book. And I said, oh, you weren't supposed to see that. And he said, no, it's just, why wasn't I invited to the party? So he's been invited to every party since. <laughs> Hello, I'm David Syme. I'm a concert pianist from America, living in Ireland full time. And I do about 40 or 50 concerts a year in Ireland, the US and Central Europe. And I'm very happy to live in West Cork on the Barra Peninsula. And some of the concerts that I do in Ireland are held right here in our home. I had no interest in coming here at all or to Ireland at all. I had played all over Europe, over 20 different European countries, and I had no prospects in Ireland, but I met this lovely lady who I'm honored to be married to, Suzanne, in 2004, and she had this home in Ireland and where she lived half of the year. So it sort of came with the territory. And the first year that I was here for a few months, I was approached by a local businessman, Declan Wiseman, who <clears throat> asked me if I would be willing to play a concert to raise funds for a school in Africa. The word got around right away that uh, there was some new person in town. Everyone knows what everyone else does here. I said, sure, I'll do that. And I, I would play a concert to benefit this charity. And the response was so wonderful to my playing. I played on an old broken down piano. Not all of the keys worked. But there were a hundred people in this house, this farmhouse, and all the furniture had been moved outside to make room for folding chairs. It was just so wonderful. It was sort of like being in the movie, The Quiet Man. And I was so taken with the absolute love for music and reverence for culture and the arts that I quickly said to myself, why would I ever want to live anywhere but here? Ireland has a population of something like 5 million people. We had moved from an urban environment of Houston, Texas, where there were about 6 million people just surrounding that city. And of these 5 million people, Suzanne <clears throat> told me that 40,000 of them are self-described as poets. So why wouldn't I want to live in a place like that? People are so nice here. They're so respectful. They're so kind and courteous. So that's, and they love music. So that was the main thing to me. Every performer seeks his or her own 
particular audience, and I feel that I've found mine here. There's peace. There's silence. There's tranquility. There's beauty of nature. So it, there's really no comparison to any urban area that I've ever lived in. I'm pretty old. I'm 70, so... I started playing the piano at age three, and I was self-taught for 10 years. I played pretty much anything that I heard. I would just sit at the piano and work it out. I was trying to make my parents proud of me, which worked to a varying degree throughout my life. But it gave me a, a purpose, especially in my adolescence. At age 13, I started piano lessons with a uh, very strict piano teacher and in a year I played the Beethoven first concerto with my high school orchestra <clears throat> and then three years later I played the Rachmaninoff second concerto with the Detroit Symphony. I was from Detroit. I went on to attend the Juilliard School and in Indiana University, two of the top music schools in the world and represented the U.S. in international piano competitions in Poland, as I have mentioned, and in Russia, and played in Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, Kennedy Center, Wigmore Hall, and in uh, many European countries, over 20 of them, I think. And what it all comes down to is that I just love playing for people, and I love the communication that results from my dedication to and love for music. Uh, Chopin Waltz in C sharp minor. It's, it's the first piece that I heard that I s said unequivocally, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. I was 12 years old. I learned it by ear in the wrong key and brought it to my teacher. So I was, and I was so proud of myself. He was not that proud that I played it in the wrong key, but uh, that's the way it came out on my record player. The, the record turntable revolved too quickly, so it, it changed the key, but I play it almost every, every concert. In 1975, I, I was the guest of the <clears throat> Polish government at the International Chopin Competition, and I was selected to play in his birthplace. So that was, that was a, a wonderful moment. But actually, when I was given an honorary degree by the Royal Irish Academy of Music, that was one of my great moments here. My name is Nick Brown. I live uh, in Kilkaskin, Adrigal, uh, about 20 minutes drive from Castletown Bear. I don't come from here at all. I was born in Glasgow and I lived in London for most of my life until, no, not, that's not true. I lived in London until I was 19 and, uh, and then I got out of there. And I came to Ireland in 1990 when I came to Ireland, I first went to Dublin, and I lived there for about 15 years, working. And uh, I was working hard, and it was urban. And before that, I had lived in the countryside, and I wanted to get back there because I wanted to grow things. And um, I had worked in music and theatre, and Dublin was a great place for that. So uh, I worked there for that time, for that 15 years, and then it was time to get out of Dublin and um, in the time that I'd been there I had worked all over the country and I'd realized that this was a great place to live so uh, I and my wife and my children came I've never yet anywhere 
on bearer been made to feel unwelcome whereas I have in other places well I'm very lucky to have some land that I can plant trees on because I think it's very important and uh, it's a really good use of land and I have been planting since I got here in 2004 on the land that we have and uh, I think the world needs more trees I think the animals and creatures and the life in the world need more trees and uh, it upsets me when I drive along and I see that more trees have been cut down here and there because that means less habitat and less life and less oxygen and more carbon dioxide and all that stuff and I think the world needs it needs the life that trees represent and I'm not growing them for timber I might make a few things out of some of them I might burn some of them but uh, I like doing that and then I grow vegetables as well to eat because it's good for you and I like them and I like fruit I love apples and pears I grow them and uh, I don't think there's anything else I grow herbs I like growing because I like cooking so uh, I love growing herbs and cooking with them well when I'm asked what I do it's very often hard to explain uh, I've always played music and as a child I was offered music lessons and I tried them and I detested them. I hated being taught music but I loved playing music and I loved improvising. So I would play the piano and the mouth organ and the recorder, very unfashionably the recorder and the guitar and the mandolin and stuff. But, um, and I got quite good at that but I was never any good at music writing or reading almost dyslexic you might say when it comes to reading and writing music so um, I I kind of made a career for myself uh, working with f first of all in a friendly way with other people kind of entertaining I suppose I was, I was entertaining but I found that I really like working with children because children didn't say um, when it came when it comes to music Music is just another way of playing. And they don't draw a line between playing music and uh, acting or telling stories or um, sport. All those things are play. And I think if you apply that concept to music when you're working with children, you can get a very long way. It's much quicker than saying, this is a treble clef. This is double compound time, this is three, four, these are crotchets, these are quavers, all that stuff, meaningless to children. So if you make it a game, children will make the most fantastic music, and I really enjoyed that, because that's my style. I like to improvise. So uh, I would, when I came to Dublin, I immediately was working in theatre, because I was a bit of an actor. So I did that, but um, I was lucky enough to be asked by somebody who was about to set up an art centre for children in Dublin called The Ark, would I come and be their musician in residence? Which didn't mean having a sleeping bag on the floor, it meant just being around to do music theatre shows with children. And I could invent my own role. It enabled me to settle down and find my own style. And I would play music, I would involve the kids, and I would write songs as part of that. And I discovered I really loved writing lyrics. Everybody has a song. That's one of the other great things about Ireland altogether, is that every, everybody has a song. If you, if you can winkle it out of them, everybody has one. And uh, that's very enjoyable. I used to go busking in a town called Norwich in the east of England. And uh, it was a very good way to develop myself, because you're playing in front of people. Uh, they're walking past. But they, they have to listen. They have to listen to you. But they won't be there for long. You don't have to see if they clap or not. They just go. And then if they like you, they'll show it. They'll give you some money. And I wish there were more buskers. In town on Thursdays, Tom comes with his stuff and puts it out uh, in the square. And he has a little girl, Rosie. And she's the most fantastic concertina player. She can only be about eight years old, and she's teaching herself. You can hear her playing The Dawning of the Day again and again and again and again. And uh, she keeps making mistakes, 
and she goes back and does it again. Or she keeps going until she gets to the next, the next bit. She's, got, she's getting her flow together. And uh, she, she doesn't mind about people listening. It's such a good training. That's my philosophy about music is uh, it ought to be absolutely every day, like breathing in and out. T there wasn't a lot until this summer, and I was asked by Jerry Bruton to come and play with him uh, at a series of concerts that we did at the gallery in Adrigal. And uh, I knew that Jerry had put out an album and he came up to me in the square and showed it to me and said I've, I've done these tunes I'd love you to come and play them with me so uh, I thought why not and I said yes and then I listened to these tunes and he wanted me to play piano so i over the course of the summer I learned a lot a huge amount by playing with him but the other great thing you can do on bear is because it because it's so quiet because you don't have to have a lot going on you can you can write peacefully, and that's what I like to do. I like the writing. So I find I can spend the day, if, it, if the rain's coming down like today, into the studio with me, to my piano, and I write my ideas down, or I just play. And then you have the gallery here in town, at Sarah Walker, where amazing musicians come. So there's a great circuit. There's a new venue on the way, as far as I can see, of the chapel. And... Uh, I look forward to that. That would be great. I think people will come out of the woodwork when there are more places to play. The trouble is with most playing is that people don't listen to you. If you play in a pub, they think you're a recorded music or they treat you like you are. There's very little real listening. Most people like music just so that they can shout over it, which is a sad truth, isn't it? I think my favourite instrument is the human voice. I think you can probably do more with the human voice than anything else. And every instrument is really just not a substitute, but it's another channel for the human voice. When you're playing, you're singing. And that's what I love about Bear is that people do have a song. They keep it deep inside. They don't let it out, but it's there. And it's just great. Singing. Can't beat it. But I love... I love all that stuff. I love percussion. And whatever you can make a noise on, is cool. And children, I found, always have enjoyed doing that. And that's where you start. You don't give them an instrument at all until they, until they know where the rhythm is in and on them. That would be my philosophy. I come from Bantry. Uh, I was born and reared down there. And I left home when I was 17 to go work in the catering industry, industry. <clears throat> and then from there I met my now husband Mike and who's from Bear Island and um, when we got together I was on a, a kind of a course in Germany with CERT at the time it was a catering course and uh, he asked me would I join him in uh, setting up a fish company when I came back at Christmas time during the course. So I had to make the decision how to go back to Germany or set up a business with Mike, so I chose to set up the business with Mike. So we set up a fish company and uh, we bought our first punt and we went fishing for shrimp and so on and so forth. And we supply, um, and actually we used to export a lot of the fish to Spain, the shrimp and all that. And then we got into scallops and we supplied all the top restaurants around the country for a couple of years. And then after that, because I was in the catering, I wanted to open a restaurant. So we opened a restaurant on Bear Island when we settled down there. So we did have a lot of art in there. Tim Cooling used to show his work there. Um, Cormac Bardell. We used to use, you know, local artists used to have their work on the walls in the restaurant. I suppose I've been doing a lot of stuff with Mike for many years. I've never got to actually an opportunity to do something for myself. So four, year, five years ago, I decided I'd, um, uh, I wanted to do this degree course down in Sharkin Island. It was an art course. And um, I had tried 20 years ago when they set up first to do it, but I couldn't do it due to the fact that I had small children, we had a restaurant, we had a fish company going, and it was just all madness. And by chance, I met this lady in um, Vanity Hall one day, and she just happened to say she was from Sharkin. And I was saying, God, there's a course down there I've been dying to do for years. So she said, well, actually, it's coming up again if you'd like to apply. So I said, gosh, um, I don't think I might be able to put in your portfolio, see how it goes. So anyway, I got, the, got on board the course. So I did a, an art course. Um, so now a visual artist as well. 
a practicing visual artist. I graduated last year, so it's all very exciting. Uh, I'm one of these people, I'm, I'm happy wherever I am, depending on the people I'm with, obviously. So because Mike was on the island, it didn't matter to me. Uh, the fishing was a huge part of our life and I loved it. I loved being on the water and I loved hauling pots. It was giving me a great sense of freedom and something I never did before in my life uh, because we were never by the sea, actually. Uh, I was living in the country in Bantry. So the whole experience I loved, I didn't bother me. It bothered my family coming in, they felt cut off. They couldn't get off the island fast enough. Uh, they didn't want me to live there when I showed them the house we were going to buy and do up. So, But for me, it was great. I absolutely loved it, yeah, from day one. When I was younger, at the age of 12, I uh, bought my first sewing machine. Uh, my, we didn't have a lot of money at home, so... My mother used to make these um, kind of uh, patchwork quilt squares in a factory in Balangiri. They were used, they were exported to the American, you know, to USA, these quilts. So, um, so I started making patchwork squares for her. So you get so much for these squares, you make them up and you get so much of squares. So I started doing all this with her. And then I also started making my own clothes then from there on with the scraps of material that came from that factory. And I used to make uh, bags, patchwork bags, dolls, and I used to sell them in uh, quills. I actually used quills, you know, in um, Cork now, in Bantry. They used to sell them for me, and um, it was great, yeah. And I suppose I always had that artistic, artistic streak. Yeah, I'm quite creative. So the art to do now is visual art. Um, so uh, the main things I do is performance. I do photography, video, and installation, and I make sculptures. Not everybody gets the visual art, it's very different. It's not paintings, like everyone expects, you know, when they hear you're an artist, that you're a painter, which I am not, um, and that's, it's not my forte. This kind of art is, um, you're trying to get people to think differently about things. You know, you're trying to open up their minds differently, because people have a kind of a tiny, sometimes a very small mind when it comes to things, so you're trying to broaden their, their outlook in life and in, in different things in life. Yeah, well, I did the course down in Sherkin Island, a strand to DIT. Um, this course is geared towards people working, so I work full time all the time. So this enabled me because it's every second weekend you do down there and you do most of the work at home. So it enabled me to do the course. So for me, that course was extraordinary. We had extraordinary teachers coming through the door there, lecturers. Um, it was amazing. There were people from the age of 23 up to 70. So that'll tell you it's really every age is open to every age. Yeah. And everyone's creativity is so different, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So you learn from each other. You have to do a lot of research first around the topic you're doing, like uh, the Breathe project now. I did a lot of research around that. I wasn't sure how to even present it. And when I was offered this old batteries on Bear Island to put the work into, that actually helped me finalise how to present the work and how to you know, use the space. So the space became the work in the end. Uh, gun emplacement. And I had done the work on At Home at War, which is based on carrying out domestic chores in a military space. And when you're in the home, running around, doing all these jobs all the time, you actually have no time to breed. You're, you're trying to do everything for everybody else, but you never get a chance to... So um, from there then I did this exhibition on the island recently, um, and it was titled Breathe, B-R-E-A-T-H-E. But what I did was I, I used the Morse code to spell out the word breed. Um, and I made a neon sign and the sign was, had a pink lettering or Morse code, the, dash, the dots and dashes. So the pink would, for me then represents the woman. So, and then I had the Morse code going through it, spelling out the word breed. Just to highlight to everyone, we just need the breed in life. I'm going to the RHA in Dublin in November. It's a futures exhibition, there's six of us doing it. So it's kind of a big deal because it'll be running there for nearly three months and you get nearly like three and a half to five thousand people coming through the doors there to see it. You have a lot of curators coming from London, America, everywhere. So it's fantastic. Um, I was also in London recently. Uh, so I exhibited there with eight artists. You know, the title was Eight Artists for Eight Days, so that was quite amazing. Well, Bear Island is a great place, guys. There are so many nooks and corners. There are so many amazing spaces and places and hideaways. Originally I'm from Galway um, and when I was 18 um, I left Ireland and was travelling around the world and decided then to come back to Ireland and settle down in Galway but then I had more of an attraction to head down south to the sunny south 
um, ended up then in um, Skibbereen for a bit, but preferred Beira because it was wilder. It was a little bit like Connemara to me. So um, we settled down in Beira and started a family, and then it was from then on I got into Irish music. Um, the children were learning Irish music in the school, but me and some friends decided to get the kids into um, practicing music outside of the school. So um, we would meet in uh, Leeham Moore Community School um, every Tuesday night, usually about seven o'clock. And the kids, most of the kids um, were learning tin whistle at the time. Um, I was doing guitar and there was one child who was playing the mandolin. So they, it was more of a social evening for them, but we wanted to kind of instill Irish music into them as a kind of a social thing and then eventually be able to play in the pubs with them. And it was great, they, they loved it. We did it for a few years and we did, we played in pubs and we played in churches and we played at a few other kind of gigs. Um, and then eventually the children grew up and didn't want to play traditional music anymore. It's still in them, the odd time they do it. But um, now that we have a core group that gather every Tuesday over in the centre and we practice in the winter and then in the summer um, we go and we do um, other gigs around the place. We play on Jersey Island, there's a festival on Jersey Island every year. Um, there's a festival in Allahees, the Michael Dwyer Festival. We play there and obviously lots of other um, musicians play there as well. And then we play once a year on Bear Island and we play in the churches and it's grown into something that is completely part of my life. I play guitar for about um, six or seven years. Um, around here, um, just backing um, traditional music. And I found that every time I was playing in um, a pub, you go in because a lot of the, the music that we do are open sessions, so that means anybody can come in and join, which is a wonderful thing. Um, a lot of people would just join in with guitars, so sometimes you'd walk into a pub that'd be like seven guitars or something, and maybe two tin whistles, etc. So I decided that to make it nicer for everybody to hear another instrument I'd go off and find another instrument so I tried a mandolin for a while and because I had trained when I was younger in um, piano playing or uh, reading music that's why I went towards the harp also it is uh, a beautiful instrument it's got a bass and it's got it's got low notes it's got high notes you can play backing and you can do the melody as well so um, and I absolutely love it. My harp is from Galway, it's actually where, near where um, I grew up, um, and it's an ash harp. It was like listening to the likes of Martin Hayes and Dennis Cahill that it changed everything for me um, in terms of the music. Because when I was younger, I used to listen to Irish music and it all it was one sound. Um, and they elevated it, they changed music for me in terms of they, they brought it onto another plateau and brought life back into the music for me. What I absolutely love about Irish music is that um, you become part of a session. When you bring your instrument in to a pub, it's extremely welcoming and when you're playing the person beside you that you don't, you've never met before, you've never spoken to, there, there's a shared language between you, even if they're from another country, because that you're sharing the tunes and you're sharing the love of Irish music and the love of playing instruments, and that's just a wonderful thing. Donald Kelly is my name. I come originally from Garmish, Dodgy Sound, and my profession is fish sales. Uh, my father was, uh, he fished a small boat, as you know, every, nearly every, every household in Biera, they're involved in the fishing one, one way or another. I went fishing in the boat with my father at 12 years. Uh, I left school at 14, and that was, that was the, the end of the education. 
and taste, it was totally different. You, 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 I, I didn't think I was going to finish up where, where I finished up. It, it happened by accident, really. I was, I was, um, I was driving the, a, a school bus in '68 uh, from from Garnish into Castlebar here, and I used to go down every morning. Finish the kids to school at nine o'clock, and there'd be an auction at, in the pier there beside the BAM school now. The the herrings used to be auctioned there, and I used to go down to the auction every morning. And at that time, the uh, fishing started out in Garnish, the mackerel fishing with the small boats. That was in 68, 69. And it, 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 one morning, this fellow I never met him in my life, I was going into the bus when the auction was over, coming back out of Garnish. This fellow hopped into the bus and he said, is this the Garnish bus? I said, yeah. So he said, there's mackerel out in the pier in Garnish. Go out, out and buy the mackerel, tell the fisherman you'll give him a pound a box. And that's how it started. Out I went with the school bus and uh, rang him. He was staying, Holly the Skill was his name. He was staying down the hotel and I uh, rang him and he sent out two trucks and took all the fish. And that sort of mackerel fishing started in Garnish. You, you, you never know what's going to, I, I, I didn't uh, ever envisage that I would finish up managing a company the same as I am. I was approached in 1983 to manage the company by three skipper owners, both Larry Murphy, Frank Downey and Kieran Driscoll. Danish was started in uh, 64, 65. The bridge was built okay. uh, and it's developing since. Before um, the pier here was done, there was an old wooden pier at the back of us here. And that was... Um, there was a wooden, wooden structure. That's where all the fish was landed in. They had a training school in, in Greencastle. And uh, I mean, the, there's more uh, fishermen in Castlebear than any other port in the country. And it made perfect sense that, that, that the school would, would be here. That was, that was initiated by Margaret Downey when she was a director of BIM. So she got that school here. She took over as a director when her husband died. Frank. The, the, the boats, the international boats had come into Castron with years and years and years. As you know, it was the base for the, for the English Navy. Years, that's over 100 years ago. And there was, there was French, Spanish boats coming here long, 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 long time. Fishermen have been blamed for the decline in fishing stocks, right? And uh, I, I don't totally agree with that because uh, when my father was staying fishing out in Garnish uh, 50, 60 years ago uh, they went they went they, they, they fish in the autumn every year for the for the mackerel and they went out uh, one year and there was no mackerel now there's no scientist to this day can tell me how that happened that did not happen from overfishing there was no big super trawlers out in the ocean at that time. No, super trawlers are, are, are catching an awful lot of fish. There is no doubt about that. But there are other elements now. And what really annoys me is that the inshore fishermen are being blamed for the decline in fishing. You might have seen an article on the paper recently by two English anglers that were fishing here in Beira. And they were saying the angling in Beira was gone because of the inshore fishermen. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. The real reason, but nobody wants to say it, is because the seal population. The seal population are gone through the roof. Now, they're protected, they're lovely little animals, so they're nice, but they eat their own body weight in fish every day. So if you can see some seals are two ton in weight, that seal eats two ton of fish every day. That's where the fish are going. The uh, deer above in the Phoenix Park, they're culled. If they're not culled like, they'll, 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 they'll overpopulate, but the seals are not being culled. And nobody will dare mention it because it's not the popular thing to say. The industry has totally changed, like, totally, totally changed. And as I said, the world has got very, very small now. The, there's fish being shipped to Japan and all over the world now, which was not possible when I started off first. 
we if we 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 if we sent uh, we were the first to export fish to Spain from here and uh, it was like Lindy on the moon at that time in the Beira Peninsula there was money from the mackerel that was being lent in Garnish, it was being lent out in Travara in Orden and in Bellicravine. There was money going into every house. There was people, they were they were cleaning the fish in the piers, there were there was there was work. There was money going into every house. No, like the farming, the farms have got bigger and there's less people at it. And the same with the fishing. There, there, there's there's less people probably making more money now than they were that time, but there was a lot more people making money at the, at, at that time. That's that's a big change. And the same changes in farming. Tourism, I, I believe, is, is the coming thing for Beira. Right, the fishing has changed totally. There's lots of quotas and the fishing is 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 no I mean when 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 I started uh, when the company started first, uh Dunmore East was a long way away. No, the same fishermen are landing into Norway. The place, the 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 the, the world has got very very small now, and the the fishing is is boats are bigger. They're fishing less time. They're now fishing five or six months of the year. So in order to, for the company to diversify, we went in, into the tourism, and we we started with the wheeling as they call it at him, and then we went to the hotel, and hopefully we do something else. There are changes for, for the better and for worse, really. Um, um, I suppose from my point of view, there are far fewer pubs than there were when I came. No, I won't say, well, that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's up to people's opinion. There was more of a social thing here when I was here because you had the, uh, um, you, you had the Bay, Barry Bay Hotel was open. You had came at Trinan open. At the moment, you just have one hotel. Um, but uh, I think overall, there, there, not, not a lot has changed in Castledown Bear, I must say. Sometimes you'd say, well, is it, is it up to communities themselves and individuals, you know, to make communities? And, and, and I've noticed too a lot of, a lot of rural Ireland. I'm from Skibreen originally, and Skibreen is full of, of, of blowns, we call them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's they keep communities alive too. Um, you have a lot of it here as well. It's people that come into communities, kind of. They come to live in a place because they like living in the place, so they rejuvenate, you know, small commu rural communities like that. And it's a very tolerant place. I've lived in intolerant places, and Bear is an amazingly uh, accepting place, uh, which is just as well because there's a lot of blow-ins. It's nice to have some place to come home to as well, isn't it? You know, if you grow up in a place like this, it's nice to come home, even sometime with your own children or something near to come. They are steeped with artists. They all come here to live. I think they love the, the landscape and the, the people. <laughs>